Welcome to Formation. Welcome back to Formation, or welcome to Formation for the first time. It is a weekly conversation for followers of Jesus. So I found two followers of Jesus who are out on the sidewalk and asked, asked them if they would come in and be part of this program, which is the way one of them likes to say that. <laughs> That's my friend Shannon Moore, who's laughing Hello. now. Kara Watts is here as I well. Just happened to be on the sidewalk. <laughs> it is the beginning of Advent, I which we are it. excited and overwhelmed about. A little bit. But we have a resource that we're going to. Um, spend some time on across this wonderful season. And it is a book by Jan Johnson, Abundant Simplicity. Everybody, show your copy of the book. Discovering the Unhurried Rhythms of Grace. I think if there was ever a season where simplicity would help to balance craziness, it's probably Advent. Mm -hmm. So as we move through what is a holy season, we are bombarded with what is commercial, um, with busy social calendars, with how we measure our lives by things and too much to do. And so we're going to let this book critique us over the next few weeks as we struggle through Advent and try to keep uh, ourselves focused on what is holy. So here's what I'm going to... First, wait. First, I want to ask the two of you, what do you love about Advent? I love the that feeling of anticipation. I I think of Advent as sort of dark and you know it's the longest days of the year and I love the dark purples of the liturgical season. Um I don't know it's really special to me and it lies in such contrast to the bright shiny of Christmas which starts earlier and earlier all the time. Um but I, I really like, you know, that dark feel, sort of that minor key mm -hmm. feel of the season of, of Advent. Well, waiting for the one who is coming. Mm -hmm. That anticipation. Yeah. What about you, Kara? I think I like the intentional slowing down, which I, I just think of, you know, we have been in Christmas season, which is different than Advent. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, kind of a secular Christmas season since before Halloween even started, more and more people put their Christmas trees up before Thanksgiving even. And so Advent to me is this like, okay, wait a minute. All of that can happen, but this is what we're doing. And so it's this intentional moment of slowing down and paying attention to the Christ child is coming. And to me, that anticipation, you know, along with everything else that's happening is that, that buildup of just, we're just waiting for this, tiny child i mean an infant i think it's just a miraculous way of almost waiting. a counterpoint yeah to all, the world in which yeah, we live all the other stuff that's going on and really what we're doing is waiting now when was the because i know your background uh when was the first time you ever heard of advent for me it was when i was at, went to the catholic church after after when I was in college, and um, that was my first taste of the liturgical calendar and seasons and um, Advent. But, you know, I know a lot of Baptist churches and, and more mainline-type churches that practice Advent, if not Advent and Lent these days, churches that never would have considered it when I was growing up. Yeah. How about you? I remember having an Advent candle that was part of worship is when I was growing up, mm -hmm. and that was a big deal to get to light the Advent candle, and the big candle was, you know, on Christmas Eve and waiting for that. Um, but I don't remember it being an intentional season. That doesn't mean that it wasn't. I honestly don't think I really grasped Advent until I myself was planning and organizing Advent. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I was looking at, okay, wait a minute, what does this whole church year look like and and really it just became more meaningful in the midst of trying to understand how to how to teach that and what does that look like and how do you you know it was through doing it really specifically that I think that mm -hmm. I paid more attention to it truthfully mm -hmm. so just kind of a different so it's interesting to think about uh, some of you listening who are joining us 
in this conversation who it had it was a reality in your earliest memories it was a season that led to the birth of the Christ and it was um certain things happened in church um yeah so i was i had moved into the methodist church as an adult and i think that was the first time that i sat and realized there was a season leading up to christmas right you know and there's i can, and, and even now i think we hear it sometimes why don't we sing those christmas carols like it's christmas time why you know like you're hearing them every place mm-hmm. else but in church we're singing the Advent. We're trying music. really hard to right. wait, right, and, and pay attention. And it is hard, um, and and understanding that, understanding why we do that, I think, is a really important aspect to what. And, and then you, the celebration at Christmas. And as someone who used to be a music minister, mm-hmm. I can tell you, you are putting your life in your hands if you <laughs> if you don't do any Christmas carols during the season of Advent because that I mean it's sort of like. By the time we finally do get to Christmas as a culture, um, everybody's everybody's been, tired yes, of it. Everybody's, because it started right, because right it after started, Halloween, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I, I had a clergy friend back home in North Carolina who his family really practiced Advent. They went out on Christmas Eve and got a tree. Wow! And you know they were real cheap then, but that wasn't why. <laughs> but they they brought the tree home and decorated the tree, and then they did the twelve days of Christmas. Mm-hmm. And so his kids were. You know, they didn't get everything on Christmas Day like so many of their friends did, but then they had 12 days of yeah. of Christmas. Which lead up to Epiphany. Right. So, yeah, I think it's an, it's an interesting season and the it w- different ways that we acknowledge that and it live that out. It feels to me like this season is the one where we are called to live over against the culture mm-hmm. more than any other time of the year. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we really would be true to this prayerfully waiting and watching for God, what God is mm-hmm. is doing in the world, if we really attend to that, mm-hmm. we're pretty much in a different place than anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you like all of those Hallmark Christmas movies, you probably have to start watching those in August. October. <laughs> August? Well, I think they August. the 25 days of, uh-huh. don't they? Of, I do think there's a, well, I think there are a lot of them. There are a lot of those <laughs> movies. There are a lot of those movies. All right. Oh. Well, so back to simplicity. And I think simplicity, um, we are choosing a topic that will be over against uh, the days ahead and and kind of asking you to be part of this experiment with us and see how how we can be shaped to practice and receive what God has to teach us during this holy season, to receive it uh, more intentionally. And and we can also disagree with all of this as we talk about it together. So I want to read just the opening two sentences and then you two react to it. This is, <gasps> well, I haven't read it yet. Oh, okay. Jan Johnson, Abundant Simplicity. Here's how she opens. As followers of Christ... Many of us would like to live a conversational life with God and be filled with a deeper sense of God's companionship. We'd also like to change, to be more kind and less crabby, more generous and less self-absorbed, more genuine and less forced. You agree with all of that? I think so. Yes? Yeah. Yes? I mean, I think at the heart of, our, I think our, we are our best selves who God created when we are without some of that and our, our authentic, genuine selves. I like her phrase, a conversational life with God. Mm-hmm. What? How do you hear that? What does that mean, do you think? Well, I, I think if we had our druthers, as the saying goes, that when we talk to God, we would clearly hear God back. And, it would, yes, and, and a, a two-way like conversation, this. right? Mm-hmm. Um, but doesn't usually work that way. right. <laughs> <laughs> so that idea of walking with God um, through the days, mm-hmm. observing, listening, paying attention, getting the benefit of God's wisdom and guidance as we move through, um, is is an ambitious goal, but it's a worthwhile goal for sure. Mm-hmm. Kara's going to read to us an experiment about how we get to that kind of life, a little description, and then we'll talk about it. 
One way to breathe out the frenzy of life is to weave disciplines of simplicity into our daily rhythms. Simplicity is the factor we most often overlook when we're seeking soul-nurturing companionship with God. It is the unstated component of a retreat that we can't easily practice at home or work. During a retreat, our speech is slower and simpler, perhaps even to the point where we become silent. Access to possessions such as clothing and electronics is limited, so we are less distracted. Time flows slowly and easily. Leisure abounds. Without realizing it, we are practicing disciplines of simplicity. Simplicity of speech, frugality, spaciousness of time, holy leisure, simplicity of appearance and technology. Simplicity is not a discipline itself, but a way of being. It is letting go of things others consider normal. It's an inward reality of single-hearted focus upon God and God's kingdom, which results in an outward lifestyle of modesty, openness, and unpretentiousness, and which disciplines our hunger for status, glamour, and luxury. We practice simplicity when we intentionally arrange our life around God, what God is doing in us and in this world, and let the rest drop off. Mm. I love how all of that sounds. It's hard. Mm. Simplicity of speech. I'm not sure exactly what that would mean. Um, simplicity of I speech. I think mean what? saying what needs saying, to be, be said direct, and no more. Let your yes talk, be yes. yes. Let your no be no. Mm -hmm. Stop talking so much. Mm -hmm. Frugality as a form of simplicity. Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Yes. Spaciousness of time. And she's going to talk to us right. as we move through this about all the things we fill our days with. Right, mm -hmm. yeah, so leaving that and space open. Moving, mm -hmm. yeah, moving um, those mm -hmm. things out. Holy leisure. Would holy leisure include watching TV? I, she would I, say I no. I, I don't ever want to say, you know, there's no space for that, but I think it would be hard for that to yeah. be... And I, I think she would say that's not it. Mm -hmm. Instead, it's going out for a walk and experiencing creation in some way or mm -hmm. that connection. If, How do you connect with God in the downtime, mm -hmm. I think, the leisure time? So we're trying to, um, to, her words, breathe in the oxygen of real life with God. But she would suggest to us the problem is we're not breathing out the daily chaos that chokes out such interaction. So we're trying to get more God in our life, but our life is all filled up with a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't allow us. And that's hyperventilation. Right. <laughs> right. I mean. right. Yeah. One of, one of the things in my, in my background in behavior and understanding behavior, one of the things I sometimes say is we all have 24 hours to get the best things that we possibly can. That's all we have. And we're all working really hard to get what we need and, you know, all of that. And and that makes me think of this. Like we there is only so much time. And if we fill it all with all of this stuff, right. There's no room. I think about the number of hours spent on social media. Mm -hmm. And I have a friend who has never ever had one social media account of any kind. And I I think that I went one glorious year without I gave up all social media and it was wonderful, but it's hard. Mm -hmm. um, you were talking about the difficulty of of the simplicity. It it was it makes life harder um, because and, and so much runs through that. Technology definitely is against simplicity, mm -hmm. wouldn't you say? I, I think of course, it, technology well, I think it, is it, maybe <laughs> making it possible it, for us to have this conversation with right. you. I think it starts out to make things simpler, and then we and complicate then it. We get pulled with, into it. One of the things that she um, talks about in this first chapter, and I would really recommend that you see get uh, a copy of the book and read along with us over these next few weeks, but she she describes Christians as kind of bloated, she uses that word, because as we seek to draw closer to God, we pack a bunch of stuff into our life, but we haven't made space for that stuff, and so we become a little intense a little mm -hmm. competitive in our holiness would you would you say that's a good word <laughs> yes because we're just driven we become driven 
um, to get the most out of life and listen as closely as we can for God. And we haven't made the space. So what she teaches in this first chapter is the disciplines of engagement. That would be pulling in more that is holy and disciplines of abstinence, which is clearing the space so the holy be, can be more authentically part of who we are. Mm. I think this is the first time, and I've always liked to read about simplicity, that I heard someone teaching so forcefully about abstinence, about clearing things. Not, you know, th that your life becomes just sitting in a chair, but that you've got the space to take a walk instead of being in front of the television. And you are intentional about what... Christians can also be some of the busiest people in the world, oh, gosh. right? Yes. And think, I mean, if you keep buying clothes and put them in the closet, but you don't ever take anything out, it's going to be a mess. It is. So let's <laughs> weigh those two things, the disciplines of engagement, engaging in God at work in the world, and the disciplines of abstinence, um, which would include the classically fasting, solitude, silence, chastity, secrecy, frugality, simplicity of speech and time. Um, those would be the classic ways of understanding abstinence, but it could also mean clearing the space on Sunday afternoons so that you are out in nature and you're just feeding yourself mm -hmm. and getting ready for the week ahead because you haven't filled up your day with all kinds of chores so that you can be, including going back to church to a meeting. Right. And it's hard for us as pastors to encourage you not to spend all your time at church, but there is a way that we keep seeking what seems to right. be missing without making the space for it. Yeah. Well, and, and giving and, and recognizing that and saying, you know, some of those meetings you make and some of them, mm -hmm. you don't. I think we're trying hard. to be not so meeting centered. I think absolutely. The, the ministry I've been part of in the last couple of years has had much, 100%. I think uh, maybe the pandemic taught us. I Ab think so. Yeah, that absolutely. Life goes on without you, meetings. You can feel it drawing you back. Mm -hmm. Yes. You can feel it drawing us, trying to draw us back. But I do think that I, we definitely have fewer meetings than we did 100%. when I first got yes, here six years absolutely. ago. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and even just all of our programs that we offer, there's so many incredible programs that we offer during Advent. And, and it's not to do all of them. But it's to find the find to clear the, thing the time and to, to find yes, the thing that's that right. speaks to you. Not try to have perfect attendance right. of all. That's not what we're going for. Activities. And so I think that's an important message for us to to share as we're looking for simplicity. Shannon has a quote from the book that he's going to share with us. If you happen to have the book, it's on page twelve. The process of choosing the engaging relational life we were built to live is described by Pedro Rupe. Nothing is more practical than finding God, than falling in love in a quite absolute final way. What you are in love with, what seizes your imagination, will affect everything. It will decide what will get you out of bed in the morning and what will you do and what you will do with your evening, how you spend your weekends, what you read, whom you know, what breaks your heart, and what amazes you with joy and gratitude. Fall in love, stay in love. And it will decide everything. I love that idea of being with God through the days and um, having that kind of life-giving uh, relationship, which is so much better. Then I only prayed for 10 minutes today instead of 30 No, there are people praying more than I am. Yeah. Let's, so we've got some scriptures to look at. Kara, which, what do you have, have for us? I uh, have Matthew chapter 6, uh, verses 19 through 21, and verse 33. It says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Verse 33 says, But strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will, given, will be given to you as well. Those seem pretty straightforward, right? Yeah. Descriptions of, of the life that That's is rich in God and not... What, what scripture do you have for us? Um, I have some words of Jesus from John chapter 15. He says uh, in verses 4 and 5, 
Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And you know, part of that idea of the disciplines of abstinence is pruning, Mm -hmm. which is part of that same passage uh, from Jesus being pruned um, to be as fruitful as possible. What we're talking about in this clearing the space in our lives is really a a form of pruning what isn't producing faithfulness. Right, and and doing away with that idea of complete independence. Yes. But acknowledging our dependence on God and our interdependence mm-hmm. with each other. That word abiding. What is what else do you have? Um, I have a passage from Psalm 139. Verses 23 and 24 say, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. That's one of my favorite verses. Mm-hmm. I like that. Know my anxious thoughts. Yeah, and yeah, and lead me. Well, I've had a lot of those lately. Have you? Absolutely. <laughs> and so, like, yeah. Uh, see if there is any offensive way in me. Lead me mm-hmm. in some. Lead me in a different direction. Opening ourselves to God's um, observations of who we are, and which tells us that anxiety and and all that is not ever. Right. The way everlasting. That's right. Well, one more passage, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. And I've seen all kinds of artists' attempts to illustrate this, mm-hmm. and I bet you have to listen to these words. Um, Jesus speaking. Enter then through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction. And there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life. And there are few who find it. That doesn't sound very hopeful, does it? (laughs) It just sounds complex. I mean, when we think about simplicity, that makes it sound, it's, I think it's just, it's hard. It's it's not going to happen automatically. It's It's going to be, because we clear the space and we keep searching for the, so this is like, oh, we, you well, can't find it without looking for it because you're going to keep coming to the uh, gate that's wide and the road that's easy. Well, and we already said that you know simple doesn't mean easy, but that's a simple concept to understand. Right. That's very simple to understand. It mm-hmm. takes effort. It takes it's the discipline. It takes the work mm-hmm. to do it. It's easy to follow the, yeah. the easy paved way. I think the early early on when I read this verse, the gate is narrow and the road is hard. I just thought, okay, but if I find that gate and I get through it, I'm I'm in. Now I'm home I've free. got it. No, the, no road the road is hard. That leads to life. So uh, this momentum that swoops us up at this very holy time of the year, it, it's hard to resist. I think I'm going to write a song called "The Long and Winding Road." I believe that's already a song. That sounds like a great idea. Oh, might be a hit. <laughs> We hope that you will continue with us for these coming weeks, and uh, let's continue to encourage each other about simplicity and to be willing to look um, honestly at what God, where the Spirit is moving in our life and what God would have us change. I think we get to January, and we're pretty good. That's when we're cleaning out everything, mm-hmm. and you know. But how do we move through this? this season in a way that allows us to hear God's voice more clearly, uh, to find that uh, narrow gate uh, through the season of Advent and discover for ourselves what is holy. So we hope that you will join us. We are thankful always to hear from you. We'd love to know what you think about simplicity. Maybe you have struck on um, a particular passage of scripture or a practice that is helpful for you. We'd love to hear about that. Uh, formation at uccftw.com. God bless you and keep you this week. And we will look forward to our next conversation. Take care.